So this is an extract of The Last Days of Rabbit Hayes and we meet a healer by the name of uh, Michael Gallagher and it's when Rabbit, the lady who's dying of cancer, her parents are desperate and they're going to see this healer. It's a last ditch attempt when medicine has failed them. Michael Gallagher looked frail and thin when he ushered them into the old broken down bungalow. They followed him to the kitchen, which was inhabited by six cats, all apparently happy to sit anywhere but the floor. Christ on a bike, Molly mumbled. Tea or coffee, he asked. You're all right, Molly said. There was no way she was drinking or eating anything in that house. He pointed to two chairs tucked under the kitchen table. They pulled them out and sat down. He sat opposite. What was so sensitive you couldn't talk about it over the phone? Oh, it's not sensitive, not really. I just prefer to discuss business face to face, Molly said. People found it much harder to say no to her in person. Okay, he rubbed his prominent nose with his forefinger and thumb. A tough subject for some coming up next in the last days of rabbit haze. And although, obviously, we all know that someday we're going to die, why is it so hard for us to talk about it? Well, Anna McPartlin has tackled the topic head on and it's well worth the read. Stay tuned as Anna's here to tell us more about herself and her characters. It's the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast exclusive to WH Smith. Richard and Judy, great stories and conversation, yours for free. Just visit whsmith.co.uk slash Richard and Judy. Rabbit Hayes is a 40-year-old mother dying of cancer. The novel doesn't flinch from that, and yet Rabbit is full of jokes and good humour. The family surrounding her are richly drawn, witty and wise. And it's a very warm, funny novel, which will make you laugh whilst dabbing at your eyes with a hanky. And the writer, Anna McPartlin, is with us now. Hello, Anna. Hi. Hello. Terrific. I mean, that's what I, I, I did love about the book. I mean, obviously it's sad. You know right at the beginning what you're in for, because right at the beginning of the story, Rabbit is going into a hospice, her mother's going with her, and you know it's going to be her last days. In fact, they turn out to be her last week. Yeah. Um, and she resolves an awful lot of stuff with her family and her past and all the rest of it. But you think you're in for a tearful ride, and you are actually to some extent, but there's a lot of humour in it as well. And do you think that's, I mean, I certainly think that's true when a loved family member is dying. But you find that, you find that very strongly, that when people are dying, the family finds refuge in humour. I think so, and I, and I think, because people often say, is it a cultural thing, is it an Irish thing, and I don't think it is, actually. I think it's a global thing, because mm. the thing about it is, is that no one's going to mourn you if you're depressing or if you're a horrible cow, you know what I mean? People have to love you, mm. and so if you're loved, and if there is love, there is always humour, mm -hmm. there is always joy, mm -hmm. right up until the very last second. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the beauty of it, and what was interesting for me was that when I was doing the publicity for this book in Ireland for the summer, I, I was talking with different people and the, the, there was one particular um, radio uh, DJ and his producers worked with him uh, right from press back in the 70s right to now, mm. followed him into radio. And they were talking about the book and it, it had happened before, but it was interesting because it happened on air. The two of them had lost a, a, a mutual friend mm. from the press about... 15 years before mm. and they started recalling the last days of his life during the interview and the two of them started laughing about you know the jokes and the way he'd pull out the whiskey and they'd yeah. have to help him in and and I've and that's really what this book is about it's about that it's a sad celebration of life it's Never, nevertheless it's a heck of a topic to decide to write a book about the last week of a woman's life a young woman's life you yeah know? why did you decide to do it it's quite risky yeah, I mean, it wasn't really a decision I made. It's not like I kind of went, oh, I'd like to write about <laughs> cancer. You know, I, I, you know what I mean? <laughs> mm, cancer sounds good. Um, no, <laughs> I, um, uh, my mum went into a home when she was 42. 42? So she's the age I am now. Yeah. So she had MS and we, I, I lived with her and my grandmother um, from the age of five to 11. Um, Granny was old you know and she mm. she wasn't in a fantastic way and mum's ms was very progressive so my parents split up when i was five we moved into granny's in dublin and mum's ms was progressive mm. and and pretty much diagnosed within about six months of her walking out on my dad mm. so as a result we kind of limped on together forgive the term until i was about 11 for about six years um and then it became impossible. Mm. Um, mum was too sick. 
granny wasn't able and so we were separated and mum mm -hmm. went into a home. So I kind of grew up with a hospice, a long term hospice mm -hmm. in terms of um, I'd, I, I would move to Kerry then to a little small town called Kenmare in Kerry. Um, and I lived with my aunt, my uncle and my cousins and I used to go up and down and see her all the time. Mm. So it was a series of goodbyes yeah. and hellos. And mm. um, we had this really great relationship where we'd spend all this time together just sitting and talking mm. and, you know, having fun. And it was, a, it, yeah. you know, she was a great character. And even all those years when I was with her and minding her and we were minding each other, we had a very kind of symbiotic relationship because of her mm. illness. It was never scary. She always had this great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so mm -hmm. an example would be, say, I'd come home from school and it was probably around two o'clock in the early days when I was like seven or whatever. And mum would be on the floor. So clearly she had collapsed on the floor mm. at some point during the morning. Mm. And God knows when that was. And yeah. had been there ever since. And had been lying yeah. there. And... Um, yeah, the only thing that would really get on her wick was that she always tried to keep her cigarettes and her lighter in her pocket in case she, <laughs> she fell. <laughs> because she'd be really pissed off if the fags were just, just there fair. where she could yeah. see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. right there. Yeah. What Judy talks, and, and you've discussed it at length here mm. already, about the importance of humour in these human tragedies as yeah. they play out. You know? Yeah. Um, and I've mentioned this in other interviews because it's been pertinent, but my own mother died this year. Um, oh, and sorry. I was called from, from Cornwall, where we were, because the, the staff at her home said, she's going, now's the time, and drove through the night to get there. And the first thing she did when I arrived was tell me a joke. She basically, she was, she was dying of cancer, and she was incredibly thin, I mean, it was skeletal. And I arrived and sat next to her and took her hands, and she said to me, the first thing she said to me, opened her eyes, and she said, I need to lose a bit of weight before I go up there, don't I? <laughs> you know, and it was funny, it was funny. What do you think it is about the human spirit that even when it's the afflicted person, who is mm. about to pass over to wherever we go, uh, maintains that wonderful, insouciant insolence, you know, in the face of a nasty death. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I think it is just the human condition. And I think mm. it's just making the best of things. I mm. think that's what we're programmed to do, mm. is make the best. And also, I think that in your book, um, this family stuff is mm. hugely important. I mean, I love Molly, uh, mm. the yes. mammy, the Irish mammy, yeah. who... At, while being full of strength and wisdom and determination to cope, is at the same time devastated mm. that her daughter is dying so young. But, but nevertheless, they have a kind of wry connection, which means they can still joke about it. And then there's her father, who's very kind of um, phlegmatic and strong and doer, and her siblings. And I think it's that what makes the book work is that strong, interactive family feel round the deathbed. Mm. It's fantastic. I mean, we, everybody has lost a loved one, um, and we can all remember that. And I remember my father's death was very similar. And you never lose, I don't know, maybe we just have to hang on to it, but we all know we're going towards it. Yeah. We all know we're heading that way. And therefore, you know, you have to see it as a part of life. What I mean, one of the funny things about... Your book is it's very irreverent, very quite foul mouthed. I have to say, <laughs> quite foul mouthed. You have to quite quite a strong stomach. But again, that's very kind of um, it feels very sincere. Mm. And I'm really interested in your background because you were a, um, a stand up comedian for a while, mm. weren't you? Yeah, very short time. Um, <laughs> I, I'm stand not, up and get out. Well, I, I much prefer sitting down. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> um, that is what happened. I was like, I love the writing of it, but the performing of it, I was like, oh. God, I'm missing Carnage. It's strange. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that comedian say the same thing yeah. a thousand times, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I wasn't good at the sitting there and getting up and doing the thing. And, you know, and also I had a comedy partner at the time and she loved doing, repeating the same thing over and over again, whereas mm. I always wanted to write something new. And right. she'd be like, I hate you. We've just worked this out. And I'm yeah. like, oh, forget that. Let's move <laughs> on, you know. So I kind of realised very quickly that I, that's not what I was supposed to be doing. And then the putting me in the room thing and sitting down, that's where right. it all happens. And I'm much happier there. Mm. But just to get back to the, the idea of the, the bonds that, you know, when you talk about when your parents die mm. or whatever, it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what circumstances the person died. And I knew my mum was very, very sick for seven years before mm. she died. And it was still a shock to me, mm -hmm. even then. It doesn't matter if you lose them at 17 or no. 70. It is 
that part of you mm. that is gone, that mm. you lose, that you'll mm. never get back. That person takes yes. a small piece of you with them. And so those last days are so, so vital and so important because mm. there is an enormous amount of joy in the smallest moment because you know that when you let that person go, mm. you're, you're letting it. go. Yes. It is. Th- and, yes. and it's it, it's it's incredible because when somebody is dying, it is the time that everyone around them feels most alive because mm-hmm. they feel most of everything. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think you're absolutely right there. What about the deeper differences in the characters in the book? And this is so true of life. There are characters like her mother who will not accept that her daughter's mm. going to die, even though it's plain as a pint stuff. Mm. And there are others who are completely OK with it. Well, they're not OK with it, mm. but they understand that. That's, what do you think is the difference between those people, those who can accept that a loved one is about to pass and others who are in denial about it right up until the last second? I think it's a funny thing, you know, because um, it's all down to personality. You know, we're all different types of personalities. And I think what's interesting is the, what I've found through my life, and it hasn't just been mum that I've lost. My, my father had cancer. I, I kind of lost him well before cancer took him. But but I, I've, I've lost two pals to suicide. It, it's an interesting thing. Um, I... I think that some people can deny right up to the second somebody dies mm. because that's their way of coping mm. and that's their way of getting on. Mm. But actually, they're way more accepting after the, mm. the fact, whereas the person that seems to be OK all wise, the way yeah. up yeah. Yeah. can actually just completely fall apart yeah, that's a very good point. afterwards. People are so fragile. You never, ever know. And that's the thing. That's what fascinates me about the human condition. And that's why I like to mm. write is that Every individual is so, so fascinating. And you think one person will react in a certain way. You Mm. think, I know them so well. Or even yourself. Mm. I know myself so well. Mm. And then you can completely be surprised by Mm. or surprise yourself. I also think it's lovely the way the family sorts out this central dilemma about Juliet, Mm. who is uh, Rabbit's little girl, Mm. who's only 12 and losing her mother. Yeah. Has come to terms that her mum's been ill for several years, but hasn't come to terms with the fact that she's dying but the big thing is rabbit's a single mother so what happens to julia after she dies yeah and that big kind of family dynamic because it's by no means certain what's going to happen in those last few days is resolved and resolved in a way which you as the reader know and likely as it sounds is definitely the best thing that can happen mm. and that's what kind of in a sense sort of it gives a place, the thing almost a happy ending mm. because Rabbit, when she goes, knows that she sorted out her daughter. The daughter knows that she'll kind of be happy and therefore the whole thing is going to be okay. And that I think that's brilliant actually because that in the end, that's the basis of all human life. If you've got dependents, what happens to them? Can you leave them happy and satisfied? It's a life goes on mm. story. Mm. And that's the thing is that nothing no story ends in the death of one person Mm. it everybody else carries on Mm -hmm. and that's the that's the thing i mean one of the things with when mum went into the home i was uh 11 and there was negotiations round table (laughs) negotiations and i i mean i only heard about them afterwards but i remember my granny being quite put out that she was like well I said I'd take you I was the first by the way to say I'd take you I had no problem at all oh but right. Mary stepped in and you're too old and I was thinking jeez I'm young enough <laughs> you're absolutely right it's, it's actually extraordinary it's very good well the last days of rabbit haze nice title Totally you can't forget really by Anna McPartlin and uh, as, as the front cover endorsement by a uh, very uh, successful writer Jane Green says a beautiful book I cried and smiled my way through it and I think that's true of anyone who reads this wonderful book and it's just as warm and entertaining and moving as you are in the person so well, <laughs> oh, thank you. lovely to meet you want to dip into a new book get much more than at any other bookshop with extra notes at the back of every recommendation exclusive to WH Smith Check out the collection in store and online and enjoy another great read with Richard and Judy. This book is an interesting one. It's one of those, very few people pull this kind of tragedy, 
comedy thing off very well. Jojo Moyes is an author who does. Yes, true. Um, and Anna does too. It is also incredibly funny. Well, I'll tell you what it reminded me of, and, and I was reading it, and we were both reading it, at roughly the time that uh, Linda Bellingham was dying. Yeah. And Linda Bellingham, of course, wrote her, wrote her book about, about the process of dying, and then made a number of television appearances days before she actually passed, and was incredibly funny mm. and good-humoured, totally brave without being noble about it, just completely took it all on the chin and made it acceptable. Because as we said at the outset, we're all going there, we're all going on, on the same road. And it was, I thought it was quite interesting, that resonance between this wonderful piece of fiction and a very good example of what the kind of um, approach to death that she was writing about with Linda Benningham. Um, but the characters are great. The mother, the Irish mammy, is fantastic. Um, on the one hand, she's dealing with this last final week uh, on, a, on a day-to-day -day level and, uh, and quite ferociously, and at the same time, she She's in complete denial that her daughter's about to die. Mm. Um, and if she does die, another thing I, I, I found really interesting was um, that uh, Molly um, Rabbit, uh, Rabbit, she, her real name's Mia, but everybody yeah, calls her Rabbit. Rabbit. Uh, Rabbit's mother, Molly, as you say, is this fierce Irish matriarch, um, is also very religious mm. and she's, she's very Catholic, very Roman Catholic, and she desperately wants to get a priest in at the end to say the last rites. And Rabbit will have none of it, none whatsoever. And they reach this very funny but fudged compromise. Um, and all these things, which are obviously taken at one level so deeply serious and meaningful and sad, she also manages to make them very, very entertaining, mm. very witty and very humorous. It's a triumph, actually. I start with one character and I build a whole universe around that character and these characters just come in and I sound like I have some kind of illness but basically they talk in my head for the guts of a year. So by the time I actually sit down to tell their story, I have their absolute voices in my head completely. I know exactly who and what they are and what exactly who and what they, who, what they want, where they're going. And I have, I always have the first page of a book in my mind and the last page completely set in stone and after that they just take me where they want to go. I, I, I literally sit down and I write, there'll be a day where I'll write from five in the morning and I won't stop till 11 o'clock at night and the, the next day I won't delete one word of it and, the ne and then the day after that I might only write for a couple of hours and I might delete half it, it just depends. Um, most of the time it's a good flow though so I, I'm quite lucky like that but I do I work so I start say a Monday morning and I'll work all day and then on the Tuesday morning I'll look I'll review what I've done on the Monday and add to that it's like a skeleton you keep putting flesh on the bones every day that's what I do right don't talk about it just do it people always come up and say to me I'd love to write and I go what have you written nothing annoys me <laughs> <laughs> Dug my head in. I'm like, well, what are you talking to me for? <laughs> write, write, write. If you really want to write, it's because it comes from a place of passion. It's not about thinking. Like, you go to a supermarket and you go, oh, I think I might have some canned soup today. I think I'll do that. That's okay. That's fine. But writing isn't about, I think I'll do. Writing is doing. It's because you've no other choice but to do it. I worked for an insurance company for 10 years and every single night I went home after a full day's work and I wrote till midnight. That's, that's being a writer. It's just being passionate enough to tell stories and loving every minute of it. And if writing's painful, don't do it. It has to be joyous. Even when I'm crying my eyes out over characters, I'm thrilled skinny. <laughs> At the bottom of it all, I'm thrilled. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to meeting a very familiar face next time on the podcast. I miss the writing now I finished it. Yes. I miss those lovely people in my head. The fabulous Sheila Hancock will be telling us why it's a good idea to try something new, like becoming a debut novelist when retirement gets dull. Join us then. The Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith.